Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen. It's my privilege to be president of the Institute. And we're having a pretty exciting day today because we're launching the new book by Dr. Carolyn Freund, Rich People, Poor Countries. Um, the book is available for sale on the website, by the way, for those of you out there who did not join us today and get your free authorized copy. Uh, joking aside, the, I, I, we're very proud of this work that Carolyn has done with the assistance of Sarah Oliver because I think it's genuinely groundbreaking. We've had a world in which, obviously, inequality has risen in a lot of ways on a lot of measures, but we've also had some pushback on some solutions to the inequality question because Obviously, we have memories of the Gilded Age in the U.S., that a Carnegie, that a Rockefeller, that people of that ilk, they may have made huge amounts of money, but they also made businesses and infrastructure and jobs along the way. What Carolyn has done, I think, is an incredibly important piece of work drawing together various strands of economics to try to test and generalize that insight. And one of the things that people in this audience may be aware of but bears repeating is that there's been something of a revolution in empirical trade economics over the last several years that we got away from the idea, the rather ridiculous idea, that countries compete. It's actually firms, businesses that compete. And Carolyn, along with our other, another non-resident senior fellow, Brad Jensen, among others, have made major contributions to this literature. And one of the things that Carolyn and co-authors have, have established is that there are firms that become export superstars, that there are businesses, think of Nokia in the past, or Zara in Spain, or Alibaba, which is less of an export but is still out there now, um, that because they're able to be competitive and at global scale in global markets, they are bringing in huge profits, generating employment, and basically reflect an allocation across global markets of factors of productivity, capital, and labor to their most efficient uses. And part of what Carolyn's past more academic work has done, if, if she'll forgive my oversimplifying, is along with work done, as I said, by Brad Jensen and others, established that this is fundamentally efficient for the most part, that it really is the most productive firms are the ones that get ahead, and they're the ones that export most, and they're the ones that pull in the most of these factors of production. And this is very important in the short run when many of you were with us for our launch of our TPP, our first round of TPP studies last week, where I think all of us, and Carolyn in particular on that occasion along with I, were trying to explain that part of the reason the U.S. has an interest in this deal and other countries have an interest in the deal is because it's about efficiency gains. It's about the competitive pressure on individual firms. It's about the reallocation to the best uses of the labor and the resources you have, and that only in global competition do you truly achieve that. But at the Institute, Carolyn and many of our colleagues all wear two hats. They usually are commenting on talking about current issues, but at the same time doing research on longer term issues. And that's where Carolyn's book, Rich People, Poor Countries, I think again makes a huge contribution because she bridges this literature about the competitiveness of the export superstars, the triumph of the individual firms, to a lot of pre-existing work on development and how you have export-led development in various forms and comp exposure to competition being critical to emerging markets getting ahead. And I think what she has done and where Sarah Oliver has made a huge contribution is they've created, and we have a technical working paper on this, a database, the Billionaire Characteristics Database. Uh, it's great fun. We're hoping Oprah Winfrey picks it up. Um, and and disentangled where the billionaire's wealth comes from across the world. And it's a unique data set. And this turns out to support an interpretation, as I said, bridging this development literature and this trade literature that 
the best firms getting ahead have a huge positive effect on their economies. And that not all billionaires are the same. And I don't want to give away too much of the punchline, and what's much more important than just the punchline is the sophistication and the rigor, the solidness of the analysis. But just to say, I think a huge message that Carolyn has for us is not all inequalities are equal. That some kinds of inequalities may be an adjunct to constructive growth, and some kinds of inequalities, such as certain forms of inherited or entrenched wealth, are not. And that as we address inequality and growth going forward, you can make that distinction. Now, Carolyn Freund, I'm proud to say, was the first senior fellow we hired full time after my taking over as president of the Institute. Uh, before joining the Institute, she was chief economist from Middle East and North Africa at the World Bank, previously worked at the World Bank, the Fund, IMF, and the Federal Reserve Board. She's published in a number of top journals and continues to do so. She's been a member of the U.S. Export-Import Bank Advisory Committee and has traded to our trade policy next door at Johns Hopkins. Um, and has been a great colleague with us working on both long and short-term trade and development issues. In addition to Carolyn suiting a topic of this magnitude and a book this creative, we're delighted to have two outstanding discussants with us today, and I'm grateful to both of them for joining us. Uh, we have with us, and of course I left the bio sheet, Someday I will be replaced by a robot, and this kind of error will not occur. Um, in addition to Carolyn, we have two outstanding discussants from the academic world, but both of whom have feet strongly in practice and public discussion as well. First, we have Professor Tyler Cowan, a local friend. From, he's the Holbert C. Harris Chair of Economics at George Mason University. Many of you know him, of course, as one of the most read and widely influential bloggers, commentators, Twitterers, and writers on economics. But of course, he does this while doing excellent, serious work. He's edited the volume Public Goods and Market Failures, has written Explorations of New Monetary Economics, has talked about what price fame, and most importantly, has a book titled Creative Destruction, which I think has a lot to do with what we're talking about today. Um, and we're delighted that Tyler could join us. Our second discussant is Professor Tarun Khanna. Uh, Tarun is the Jorge, if I pronounce it correctly, Paolo Lehman Professor at Harvard Business School. Um, he studied and worked with investors and entrepreneurs in emerging markets worldwide. And you know, a lot of us academic types in our bios have something like that, but he's really done it, okay? He's created incubators in Bangalore. He's generated businesses with his students. He's advised emerging, mar emerging market corporate sites. It is not empty praise. And he was named the director of Harvard's uh, South Asia Institute in the fall of 2010. He joined the HBS faculty in 1993. I should note, um, he, was in, he and I and our colleague Palomoro all entered grad school at the same time. While I was uh, temporarily dropping out of grad school to find myself, he was being getting a job at Harvard Business School, so that always works well. Um, and he's done some time on Wall Street. Currently, he is teaching Harvard's undergraduate general education course on entrepreneurship in developing countries. He works in the executive education program. And he's the perfect person, much cited in this book, um, to talk about Carolyn's new volume. I will ask each of them to present and speak, and then we will move to a group on the record discussion with our distinguished audience. But first, may I call on Dr. Carolyn Freund, author of Rich People, Poor Countries. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, thanks for the uh, kind introduction. Um, and I also wanted to thank and, and highlight again that Sarah Oliver helped me tremendously putting together this really large uh, database. Um, and thank the discussants, Tyler Cowan and Tyrone Khanna. I've been a big fan of both of uh, them for a long time, so it's really a pleasure to have them here. 
My uh, husband suggested that I should also thank the current uh, cast of presidential contenders because they highlight many of the issues in, in the book. So we have someone who is very opposed to inequality and wants to tax wealth heavily. We have an inherited billionaire and on the sidelines um, a self-made billionaire who, who might jump in. So uh, you know, if you want something, something to think about, uh, they're, they're right there in front of you. But actually the book is, is on emerging markets and I took it in that direction because when I looked at the data, that's actually where the starkest uh, rise in, in wealth is. So if you look at the growth in extreme wealth over time, what you see is a really large rise in, in wealth in emerging markets. So it used to be the case that 20% of the world's billionaires about t a decade ago were from emerging markets and, and now 42% are. So what's going on here? And I, I should say, as Adam mentioned, I came to this topic because I had worked for a long time on firm level trade data and looking at it brought me away from the view that SMEs are important to the view that large enterprises are really what drive trade and growth. And in the broader economic literature, this view was also taking hold with work on what's called granularity. So the top uh, 100 firms in, in the US, idiosyncr idiosyncratic shocks to them, account for a third of, of the variation in US GDP. Individual firms are really important. And these firms are created. Microsoft didn't just appear, Bill Gates created it. Apple didn't just appear, Steve Jobs created it. So you need individuals behind these firms. And you see it increasingly in emerging markets as well, which is, which is what I'm going to talk about. Another part of my research, however, with a different hat I wore for a while looking at the, in the working in the Middle East and North Africa region, uh, focused on cronyism. So what we saw in some countries there was that the richest people and the biggest firms tended to be very connected to the government, uh, to the former Ben Ali regime. So there's kind of a tension between this. Do we need big firms to grow an economy, or do we have these big firms uh, that are connected and kind of a bad thing? So I wanted to delve into that and see the activities that are well rewarded in different parts of the world. And looking at that, there is this tremendous change in extreme wealth in emerging markets. And it corresponds with a rise in mega firms from these countries. So this shows for Brazil, Russia, India, and China, their share of billionaires, and also their share of Fortune 500 companies. And they move completely in sync. And that's going to be a theme of, of the book. So the data, the main data set in this book, um, and we are making all the data available and everything is replicable that's here, is starting with the Forbes billionaire list. And the advantage of this list, while there are other lists out there, is that it has individual names. So we can trace who these people are. Um, and it goes back to 1996. And then for two years in this, period, we researched each individual to see how the wealth was made, what firm it's connected to. If it's inherited, what generation of inheritance is it? These kind of questions so that we can understand who is sitting at the top of the pyramid in different countries. And that gives a sense of what big business is like in those countries. Also uh, taking advantage of some of the firm level data sets out there, including the FT Emerging Market 500 list for recent years, Fortune 500, Global 2000, and uh, Bloomberg. So the first part of the book is really a taxonomy into who are the super rich. And the first split is simply between inherited wealth, people who receive 
who, who benefited from their parents or grandparents' uh, uh, work, and, and as a result, uh, grew their wealth from there. And then within the self-made category, within the people who became wealthy by, during their own lifetime, um, we split this group up into company founders, uh, people who are listed on a, the company website that's the main source of their wealth as the founder, executives, uh, someone like Sheryl Sandberg who was in, at Facebook early on but uh, not a founder, politically connected resource-based wealth. And this group inclu includes all people who benefited from a privatization. And the reason for that is while some people were able to grow these firms, so there are some, I'm not saying everybody in this group did something wrong, there are also those who benefited from underpriced assets, um, who were able to cherry pick, who had connections with the government. So anything where, any type of wealth where some connection with the government is important is categorized into this, this class. And finally, finance and real estate is its own class um, because it was really hard to think about how to treat this group. Some fin finance is super important in terms of helping companies to grow, but one could argue that hedge fund type wealth is not making the pie bigger, it's just shifting around uh, existing wealth. It is a zero sum game. Somebody's on the other side of the trade. Um, so the real focus is, is gonna be quite a lot on the founders because to me the most striking fact was how many of the new super rich in emerging markets are actually company founders. Um, so this is just sort of a, a quick a quick shot of some of the of, of some of the people. The lady in the in the upper right corner does the touch screens for all your Apple products. Um, the fellow in the lower right uh, from Tia Foods uh, developed mechanized spring roll wraps. So just as Heinz and Campbell did uh, mechanized food making in the 19th century in the US. This guy mechanized how to make a spring roll wrap and sells them all around Asia. So, so we see um, the same types, and that's gonna be a theme of the book as well, the same types of movement towards large firms that was apparent in the US uh, at the turn of the previous century. So, um, to turn to the sources of wealth, this shows the difference between emerging markets and, and advanced countries. And the real change, if you look at this, advanced countries pretty stagnant with about 40% company founders, um, another 40% uh, inherited, and then the rest split between financial and uh, resource related, politically connected wealth, um, all, I, I don't know that I mentioned it, in addition to privatization, all natural resources are in the politically connected resource privatization category, um, just by the nature of the fact that your wealth moves more with the price of the commodity than by your pure talent or any productivity enhancements. Um, but the real change is in emerging markets are starting to look a lot more like advanced countries. So now about uh, nearly 40% of wealth in emerging markets is also company founders uh, and, and executives. Of course, you know, two thirds or 60% to two thirds is still in the other categories. So while the, I'm focusing on this change, there is something out there to, to be concerned about, but the big change is this rise in, in company founders. If we look to the BRICS, um, what you can see is the vast difference across regions. Each, each country, each large country actually does a pretty good job of looking like its region. So Russia being dominated by the politically connected uh, privatized wealth. One of the top people on any Russian list you see is Alisher Uzmanov who spent six years in jail and made his wealth from metals privatization. Um, 
going up towards China, where you see a lot of company founders. One of the top people you see on any China list is Jack Ma, who founded Alibaba in his apartment and grew it into a firm that, that ships more, actually, than, than Amazon does. So very different sources, with Brazil having a lot of inherited wealth, maybe formerly resource. A lot of that's still connected to resource, but the people currently holding it are people that inherited it. Um, and India, somewhere in between. There's, there's a really rising group of especially tech sector and pharmaceutical founders in India, but you also see the other types of, of wealth there. Um, Just to focus in on, on two individuals, because I think it's, it's worth thinking about the environment in a country that creates a different type of, of wealthy person. Um, uh, if we look at Chile and Tunisia, these are two countries that were at the same level of development in the 1980s. Chile now has 12 billionaires and Tunisia has zero. And if we look at how these super rich made their money, what type of companies are at the top in these different countries, different contexts? In, in Chile, one of the richest people is Horst Pollmann, founder of Sensosud, first hypermarket in the 1970s, hundreds of stores across Latin America, kind of a Walmart type guy. Um, way ahead of his time in the region. On the other hand, in Tunisia, what happened was that the family connected to Ben Ali were able to privatize uh, the firms in the state-owned firms in the country and then seek foreign uh, partners to make those firms grow, but really just focusing on the local market and the owner of the largest food chain there, Casino, is uh, the President Ben Ali's uh, son-in-law. So very different views. But what I want you to take from this is that e external orientation, and that's a big part of the book as well, being open to trade turns out to be really important, both because of the competitive pressures as well as because it gives you this market to grow. And if you can compete globally, you're probably a pretty good firm. So capital's going towards the right, um, the right firms and areas, even if there are some connections, global competition turns out to be really important in order to get it more towards the unconnected type of wealth. Um, even within firms, individuals really matter. So uh, Tarun Khanna and his uh, co-authors have one of, one of the nicest case studies I came across of, of Samsung. And Samsung is the perfect example of the type of firm I'm talking about. Samsung is 20% of, of Korea's exports. It's 15% of Korea's GDP. Samsung is a super important firm to this country. Creating a Samsung in Egypt would be a huge achievement. So this is the kind of firm we, we'd, love, we'd love to see, see develop. But the leader matters. So what they show in this paper is that innovations such as introducing merit-based pay, looking how to expand globally, um, um, focusing on design and getting to the frontier instead of being a follower, all these kinds of things were policies implemented way at the top. There's a large literature that shows that individuals matter. So it really does to get these big superstar firms, it really does drill down to who is running the show. Um, so CEOs matter. And you can look at this to get away from any kind of causal issues. When a CEO dies, what happens to uh, a firm? And you find that firms uh, change their performance tremendously. So a leader at the top of the distribution, the 75th percentile, invests many times more than a CEO at the 25th percentile. So it really matters who's leading these firms. So entrepreneurs themselves are important. 
wealth and large firms do seem to go together. Uh, we see that the country's share of global 2,000 firms, the biggest firms in the world, um, and the share of billionaires, there are about 1,600 billionaires, are very closely related. And the deviations aren't too surprising either. So Russia has a little too much wealth given its share of the world's big firms. Same with Brazil. China's actually pretty close to the line, and Japan has a little too, too, little, too little wealth, maybe suggesting something about how entrepreneurship is rewarded in Japan. Um, so to get at this large firms and individuals promoting modernization, uh, one literature I came across uh, was the work of the economic historian Alfred Chandler who has a very nice uh, book, Big Business and the Wealth of Nations. And the book goes through case after case to show how the development of large enterprise was critical to growth around the turn of the 19th century. Um, and there's a newer literature that focuses less on things like scale and R&D and management, but focuses on firm heterogeneity and the allocation of resources to the most productive firms to show that individual firms matter. And both of these literatures really highlight the importance of individual firms. And I just want to focus for a second on this chart up here because it really shows how when a country comes in and starts dominating, it takes over this list. So remember the 1980s when Japan was the threat? You can see that Japan went from 31 to 135 of the top 500 firms, taking away from the US. Now China's come in from 93 to 2014, pushing out largely Japanese firms. Big firms are really important for growth. We see this in um, China and India as well. China has, of course, performed much better than India and has a much larger share of employment in large firms. India actually went through this period in the 1970s of reserving some sectors for small firms only. Guess what? Those sectors failed to grow. So recently in the 2000s, they de-reserved those sectors and this policy has led to employment uh, growing even just in the 2000s during this transition by 7% in those formerly de-reserved, uh, those formerly reserved sectors. So allowing the most productive enterprises to grow and thrive is a really important part of growth. So as I said, a, a, a part of the book really kind of compares this to US industrialization in the past. So how important are these large firms? Of course, this was also the Gilded Age in the US uh, with, with a lot of extreme wealth. Um, so it's kind of a captains of industry model of development here, where you see that as countries pass a certain point in GDP per capita, they tend to develop these really large uh, in, uh, firms that are, that are individually important to their economies. So the country labels show where each country fell in 1996, and the overall line is the tra trajectory of US per capita GDP, real GDP, from 1840 to 1927, when, when do Firms that are still around today, DuPont, Heinz, Campbell Soup, GE, et cetera, these firms were formed during our industrialization. And during the current modernization of these countries, we see very similar types of, um, of firms arising in the uh, BRICS countries. So I also want to make a point about extreme wealth and inequality. So 
Oxfam has this report that always comes out around the World Economic Forum showing how many people have the same wealth as the bottom half of the population. Last year it was 80-something, this year it's, it's 62. So this group of people that has a lot of wealth, as much as half the rest of the world population, is getting smaller and smaller, really highlighting you know, a double-decker bus has as much wealth as half the world's population. Um, is this wealth in and of itself a big concern, and how are there differences across regions? And should we consider where the wealth, who the wealth is, is accruing to? And one big difference is that while in, merge, in emerging markets, extreme wealth is growing faster, that double-decker bus is filling up with people speaking Hindi and Chinese and other languages, um, the countries are also growing. So Jack Ma is getting richer, but his compatriot is also getting richer. The difference is in the US, extreme wealth is growing and many of the part of the advanced world, mainly the Anglo countries actually, extreme wealth is growing faster than GDP. So it's really an Anglo situation where the inequality type of concerns come in and yet policymakers often talk about this as is it's more of a global problem. So there is a concern with extreme wealth. There's still too much of it that's not merit-based. But um, there is a big difference between what's happening overall in the Anglo countries, in much of the rest of the advanced world, and emerging markets. Um, and finally, I want to just talk about some policy implications. So one thing that I think is really important is, especially as wealth, extreme wealth is starting to generate this kind of knee-jerk reaction, it's all bad, and uh, these are mainly cronies, uh, we don't want to throw out uh, entrepreneurship, large-scale entrepreneurship along with that, because it's a huge part of development, and it always has been. Uh, so we need, of course, property rights well known, but free entry of new firms and openness to trade, kind of standard policies, but they really can't be understated. Even if you have a crony type economy that's difficult to change, as long as those cronies are competing internationally, they have to be producing something that's decent. So Korea supported uh, the firms as they were growing, as the Samsungs and Hyundais were developing. It was part of Korean policy to support these firms but they made them com compete globally, so much so that any financial assistance was based on their exports, on the bills of ladings, which can't be falsified. So it wasn't aimed at competing for the, for the local population, where then trying to become a monopoly might be more important. Limiting cronyism, of course, is, is important as well, and other types of bad behavior. So this gets into the idea of more transparent and open privatizations, um, government and government procurement as well. Competition policy, as the firms grow large, they might try to change rules to their favor. So competition policy is very important to come in. Just as it came in in the, in the US with the antitrust legislation, we see it starting to come in in places like China to prevent uh, monopoly behavior. And finally, tax more heavily the less productive sources of wealth. And here, two obvious candidates. One is inheritance. There's nothing particularly productive about receiving a, a huge sum of money. Uh, the US, in fact, inheritance uh, or estate taxes have come down quite sharply over the last decade. And there's no evidence, and actually even before in the 1950s and 60s, they were in the, in the 70%. Um, and the exemption was much lower. So we've seen a really sharp decline, 
And there's no evidence whatsoever that when they were much higher, less small businesses were created and such. And finally, some forms of finance. Uh, in the US especially, and in some countries, in emerging markets, it tends to be more real estate. But in, in the US, it tends to be finance, where there's been a huge burst in the number of super rich. And some of that wealth is probably not so, so clearly tied to productive activity. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. This is a great book, I thought. It succeeds at four different levels. So it has original data, which is well presented. It gets theory right. Uh, the thesis of the book is original, and it's relevant. It's hard enough to find books which succeed at two or three of these levels, and this touches every base. Uh, I also have no serious criticism of the book. So let me just talk about a few extensions, uh, questions that the book induced me to think about. Uh, first, as you heard, this is mostly a book about billionaires. Uh, but it got me thinking a lot about millionaires, you know, the close cousins of billionaires. So it's a striking fact. If you look at Russia, which I take to be one of the more malfunctioning of these economies, in spite of its level, Russia ranks very poorly for the number of millionaires. It's high in the world on number of billionaires. But as Rushir Sharma pointed out a few years ago, for a number of millionaires, Russia is number 15. So I guess I would encourage the author to, to write more about millionaires. I worry when the billionaires get lonely, essentially. I know that's not the Bernie Sanders line, but it seems to me the Russian billionaires are lonely. And that's a political danger sign. Uh, we need to give them some more millionaires. And their economy is bad at that. So to just look at these distributions of wealth more broadly and what the billionaire to millionaire ratio predicts or reflects, I think will turn out to be quite important. A second feature of the book, and I know it just came out, the world is changing very quickly. The subtitle is The Rise of Emerging Market Tycoons and Their Mega Firms. But we at least wonder a bit these days if we need a sequel called The Rise and Fall of Emerging Market Tycoons. And let me just outline for a few minutes my vision of a potential future. I'm not convinced this is where, where we're headed. Uh, but I wonder if it's where we're headed. So I look at economies quite generally. I think of low commodity prices as mostly the norm. So the last 20 years are a big exception. Julian Simon may be too dogmatic, but he was mostly right. Post-World War II, commodity prices are falling. We have this weird special period because of China. China is a one-off. Elasticity is caught up. Price of oil, super low. We, we all know this story. Uh, hope you're not selling sugar cane and so on. So we may be getting a rather skewed distribution historically by looking at recent billionaires. If your default hypothesis is commodity prices are going to stay low, and a lot of the privatizations were a kind of one-off thing. So for the future steady state, we're taking a lot of the commodities billionaires and privatization billionaires off the table. So here's a possible future. If you see scale as becoming more important, like, think of technological change. It's like everything's becoming the tech sector. Tech sector is more centralized. There's like a Facebook, there's a Google, there's an eBay. Maybe it scares some people, whether you like it or not. There's like a Silicon Valley, Brooklyn, Austin, you know, distant second, third, fourth, whatever. But if all of our economies become the tech sector, we already seem to see measured concentration going up. I think it's a plausible future hypothesis that the world's billionaires will be more and more clustered. Just like recently, they've been getting more clustered in Silicon Valley areas with finance. So I wonder if the future, once the commodity stuff plays out, privatizations are over, that wealth gets dispersed, that you'll have a lot more billionaires in the US and in China, because that's where the economies of scale are. Now, is it China, or is it like coastal China plus an East Asian corridor? I'm not sure. You could argue that either way. Could India become a third node, maybe? Could Latin America become a third node, separate from North America, maybe? But just think in terms of US and China, uh, home of the world's billionaires. I find that at least a plausible picture of the future. And uh, this book got me thinking about whether that might be true. 
This book has a lot of neat facts in it. One of my favorite facts is when the book looks at where are the women billionaires. Now, what do we know about the women billionaires? They're pretty recent on average, so they're picking up recent trends. And we know uh, this, these are not women inheriting wealth. We know very meritocratic, right? Uh, women who become billionaires lately of their own work really earned it. What's striking about recent women billionaires, they're mostly in US and China. So when you, you know, pick up recency, pick up meritocratic, uh, then what you're getting is maybe this dominant future of US, China, East Asia shown in the current distribution of female billionaires. Another great fact from the book, drawing on the author's MENA background, is it shows if you look at Middle East, North Africa, it's the one and only part of the world where basically, for the very wealthy, inherited wealth is gaining on founders. And that, to me, suggests the Middle East will not become an independent cluster. India maybe, Latin America maybe, US and China for sure. National brands, international brands seem to matter more than ever before. Everything becoming the tech sector, commodity wealth dwindling, privatizations one off from the past. Possible picture of the future. I just ask the author, what does she think is that crazy? Is that our best prediction looking forward, especially what we see with asset prices in the last six months? Uh, another way you could think about arguments of this book is to ask yourself, you know, the last 20 years, maybe they're unusual, I've talked about commodities, tech. What are other ways in which they could be unusual? Maybe the last 20 years, at least up through 2008, were unusual because of the growing role of trade. So as you all probably know, the 20 years or 18 years before 2008, Global trade is growing at three times global GDP. That's extremely unusual. It's not the case. Post-crash, global trade and global GDP are growing like more or less one-to-one. -one. You talk to people doing shipping, they swear it's going to go below one-to-one. -one. It has already. I'm not sure, but a lot of signs that trade's slowing down. Shipping companies, my goodness, that looks terrible. You know, easy, easier to like rent space on a big boat than to rent a Ferrari for a day. Uh, so that, too, could be skewing the results. We see a lot of billionaires in emerging markets uh, becoming rich, of course, through trade. And if we're in a future where trade is really slowing down, not 3x GDP, but 1x or 0.8x or like 0.6x GDP, what does that mean for the future distribution of billionaires, millionaires, uh, whoever? Well, that's another alternate hypothesis this book got me to think through. And if that's the case, if trade, uh, if those trade years are special and they're not coming back, then maybe the future billionaires are coming in countries which are large and self-sufficient. Just another option. I'm not telling you this is true or what I'm predicting. So if that's the case, you know, where is self-sufficient and large enough and has enough low-hanging fruit it can grow a lot without world trade? I think you have to say India. So many things wrong about India. I said to someone the other day, the worse your India story is, the more optimistic you should be about India, right? More bad things they can get rid of. Just a possible future. India, a lot of people, a lot of room for improvement. Uh, maybe the future billionaires are coming to India, domestic billionaires. India's big enough, right? Sri Lanka, no, unless they're exporting. And then what's the other country where the billionaires are going to come? I think you'd have to say Indonesia. A lot of low-hanging fruit low per capita income, room for growth, a lot of people, uh, even if you think resource prices will stay quite low. You could imagine Indonesia under this scenario maybe doing something internally and generating its own billionaires. Uh, Brazil, a lot of recent Brazilian billionaires. There's like the Soya King. He's really a Chinese billionaire. In fact, he's actually Chinese, for that matter, ethnically Chinese, but he's a billionaire produced by the Chinese economy. Brazil, a very tricky data very tricky data point. Arguably, we can call those Chinese billionaires. The future Brazilian billionaires with the slower growth in China, maybe that's internal. And that's another way to think about how are the last 20 years special? Has trade been stronger than usual? Commodity prices higher than usual? Is the future going to be one where scale matters much, much more and all the billionaires end up in US and China? I don't know. But the point is, Bookmark got me thinking about all that. Fascinating read, well written, great data, important topic. I recommend it highly, and thank you all for coming. Uh, great. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, uh, Adam, Caroline, for having me. It's nice to see classmates, friends, stuff like that. Um, 
You know, this, uh, this, this book is really cool. Um, it's cool because I like it, because it relates to what I do <laughs> primarily, um, as far as I'm concerned. Most of my work is, on, um, is with entrepreneurs in private sector uh, situations in developing countries, because I actually philosophically am wedded to the view, for be better and for worse, that, that uh, development will occur by uh, untrammeled entrepreneurship at the grassroots level in these countries. Uh, I'm also somewhat intellectually hostile to the view that has been um, fairly standard in economics, which is, that, uh, which, is, which is antithetical to the view taken in this book, that most of what you see in the developing countries is first order more about corruption, rent seeking, and so on. It just doesn't square with my experience on the ground. Uh, perhaps I'm over-anchoring in my childhood in India and my own background in, uh, and my family background in business and so on. Um, or, uh, or the time that I spend professionally, which is largely on the ground in China and India, and my chair at Harvard is a Brazilian chair, so I sort of touch those three economies, though I confess I know very little about uh, Russia, but, uh, but the, other, the other ones I can, I can offer some first-hand experiences. So I uh, fixated on a line that occurs in the first few pages of the book, which is to say prosperity is not necessarily a result of crony capitalism. Um, I sort of agree with it at pretty much, uh, pretty much every level. And I added this uh, little, uh, I put this little addendum, but it's often the result of enhanced productivity arising out of an entrepreneurial act. And I want to fixate on these three, three words uh, sequentially, prosperity, uh, productivity, and entrepreneurship, and say just a couple of things about them uh, related to some work that's gone on in the past, uh, share with you my own uh, biases about uh, the misguided direction of the, of the work in the past few, or the misallocation of um, uh, research resources and economic brains. Uh, and in, in a sense, it's a comment on, uh, on the profession to some extent, a uh, sociological comment on the profession. Uh, not limited to economists, it must be said. And I wear my sort of faculty of arts and sciences hat at Harvard. This is something you see everywhere. It's sort of uh, uh, homo academicus, right? You start, uh, the profession starts going down one line and then you pursue it for uh, ad nauseum until it runs out of steam. So the first, uh, the first uh, comment that I resonate with a great deal, which is personal wealth, does not necessarily follow from crony capitalism. Um, there's a big literature that started around the time I was starting my academic career 20 years ago, started at Harvard for the most part. Um, very interesting literature, very insightful. Um, talking about crony capitalism, tunneling, ferreting. Uh, a lot of my students actually wrote some of the best papers in this and are now you know, far more eminent than I am, tenured professors at fancy universities. Um, so it's not that I don't believe it, but it's a little bit like the drum, drunk and the lamppost, right? Uh, we're going to go look for the ring that we lost under the lamppost because that's where the light is shining. And we're going to extrapolate from that and say that that's the full characteristic of the entire street, even though most of the street is pretty dark. Um, another example. Example that came to me when I was typing out these slides was recently there's been a lot of attention uh, that my very, very celebrated colleague at Harvard, Steven Pinker, has, uh, has received on uh, basically saying that uh, we're living in the least violent time in the history of, history of mankind. And when you sort of look at that, which is a statement, pattern recognition across large samples of data across extraordinarily you know, broad swaths of time, and you contrast it with the front page of all the major dailies, you have to say, well, we fixate on the, on the, on the violence and so on and so forth, not, because it's, not that it's not important, but it's, uh, it's attention grabbing, but it's not necessarily a comment on exactly what's going on in the rest of the world. So that's the spirit with which I question our focus on, uh, excessive focus on crony capitalism. Um, uh, there's a lot of precedent. You know, Danny, uh, uh, my colleague Danny Roderick wrote one of the uh, uh, praise uh, uh, phrases at the back of Caroline's book. And his book in 2003, uh, in I think it was called something like in, in Pursuit of Prosperity or Paths of Prosperity, essentially says that there are, to use a colloquialism, different strokes for different folks, the different ways in which countries develop. Um, the idea that there is you know, a single consensus, whether you want to think it's a Washington consensus or a Beijing consensus or a Jakarta consensus, if one believes Tyler uh, in the future, uh, is somewhat besides the point. The point is that when you move past uh, very broad abstractions, such as you know, productivity matters, hard to, hard to argue with that, or uh, capital or factors of production should be allocated to their best uses, hard to, hard to disagree with that, uh, and you come closer to Monday morning reality in these, in these countries, the way in which things actually happen is quite fundamentally different. Uh, and we should think of uh, how that would affect our 
theorizing, policy making, as well as the acts of entrepreneurship. Uh, in my own work, this theme has popped up many times um, in the finance and economics journals, essentially saying that, basically saying personal wealth is not crony capitalism. Uh, in fact, I think for the va in, in the vast majority of cases, it's not. But that, again, is a bias that I have, perhaps the opposite bias of the, the mainstream in the profession. So uh, what about the second term, uh, productivity? So to me, the main, um, the main interesting issue about many of these billionaires, right? So uh, I liked uh, Tyler's char characterization of, uh, and the thought experiment, which is you know, if you remove the, uh, the commodity boom-led Chinese billionaires and so on, uh, where is it likely that these billionaires will, will come from? And I would have imme immediately, when the minute that phrase came out of your mind, uh, out of your mouth, I said, it's got to be China and India, uh, mostly because they're not commodity rich in these countries. The markets are big enough. Uh, and there are pockets, uh, albeit only pockets, of fairly untrammeled entrepreneurship that has already kicked in in these two places. And uh, this, is, this, is, this, is the, this is my area of academic interest. And to the extent that I could uh, offer you a generalization of what I think is kind of interesting about these entrepreneurs, uh, it's the following. Um, it has to do with understanding the nature of the compromised institutional environments in which entrepreneurs operate. What are the ways in which uh, Jakarta uh, or Bangalore or Guangzhou are really quite different from uh, Boston or Silicon Valley? Uh, and I think it has to do with the absence of these institutional supports that make starting something easy. Uh, so if you're at my university the, at, at the Harvard Business School and you want to start something up, uh, I think you're like a kid in a candy store. Not that it's, not that it's uh, easy to do. It's still hard. It requires creativity. It requires perseverance. But you've got an army of risk capital providers traipsing past your doors. You've got un, you know, untrammeled access to all sorts of data. You've got people who specialize in, specialize in return for some future payoff in protecting your intellectual property. You've got adjudication mechanisms. You've got resource redress mechanisms. There's a laundry list of institutions that you're relying on. Now, each of those is missing or compromised in Jakarta and Bangalore. And that's what I refer to in my work as institutional voids. And I think the essence of good entrepreneurship good creativity, which is, is that you find ways to either circumvent these limitations or to adapt to them in some way, or you actually basically do something about that limitation itself. One example, just to fix ideas, would be something that we all relate to, something like Consumer Reports. Right? Consumer Reports has been around for a long time. It's a nonprofit in this country. And you rely on it, or many people rely on it in, in America, to basically say, here's a new entrant providing a new washing machine. You go to Consumer Reports, you're quite sure that you will get a clean reading of the likelihood that you should be buying this new washing machine, even though it has no independent reputation. So you can rely on it. But if you didn't have that quality adjudication mechanism, which might arise out of some independent entrepreneur's actions, or regulatory fiat, or something, uh, then it's very hard for free entry and exit to occur into, into, into the entrepreneurial process. So that would be an example of a missing intermediary around which you would have to, uh, you'd have to get around to launch a new enterprise in a developing country. Um, and I think, you know, when you begin to think about the, the compromised institutional settings and not only think, in other words, think about market microstructure. Um, and by market, I mean the talent markets, market for ideas, market for capital. Um, I think you, many puzzles become adjudicated. Uh, a lot of the work that I did 20 years ago was on the contingent value of the boundaries of the firm, of broader scope or narrower scope. When is it actually advantageous? When is it not? And tied it very much to, very much to these compromised institutional environments. Uh, just another example, there's this corporate finance, pecking order theories that have been around forever in corporate finance and asset pricing. And you see that these are reversed in different developing countries because the institutional uh, uh, ambiance in which they operate are really quite different. So to summarize, I would say that uh, um, a necessary but not sufficient condition to being more productive in the developing country settings is that you find ways around these compromised institutional environments. And when you look at the examples that Caroline has, this is not what the book does. Uh, I wish it did a bit more of it but this is not what it does, is, and you look at the examples in there, whether it's uh, uh, the, the lady from Lens who produces the, uh, produces the, uh, the screens on your iPhone, uh, or Kiran Shaw, the biotech billionaire from Bangalore, uh, or the very speed, the Sankosud entrepreneur in Santiago, uh, and you look at the actual business models that they've created, they're all finding ways around these institutional limitations. So I would submit to you as a hypothesis that that's a generality that will survive empirical scrutiny when we, uh, and maybe Caroline's data set will help us get there. 
Uh, so that's how you become more productive. It's ultimately by being creative, finding creative solutions to get around these limitations, and that's the essence of entrepreneurship. What Caroline does is provide, as she put up in her slides, a very, very valuable taxonomy. You know, that's what we do as academics. We taxonomize and categorize, and I think that's our, our primary, or one of our primary um, uh, value additions to society, and I think this is a nice taxonomy. I found myself thinking a lot about uh, uh, finance and real estate and saying, you know, it's pulled out separately, and Caroline struggles in the book with, you know, should this be separate, what should I do with it? Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not persuaded. Just thinking of real estate, uh, just off the top of my, of my head, I could think of three intensely creative approaches to real estate that have come out of the developing countries, right? Um, if you go, for instance, um, uh, to, to most of, the, uh, most of the tier two cities in China, or for that matter, you even go to Tokyo or someplace like that, you will see, um, how many of you have been to Tokyo or spent some time in Tokyo? So Roppongi Hills is a favorite place for uh, expats to hang out, right? Roppongi is an unbelievably creative uh, real estate entrepreneur who has laid out the real estate platform in a way that induces you to spend a lot more money. And it's in the layout and the creativity of that real estate play that the billions of dollars have accumulated to the guy who built that enterprise. Or you think about REITs in this country, that's pretty entrepreneurial to come up with that creative uh, asset class in some ways. It's super important in this country, that's entrepreneurship. Or you think in my, in my uh, hometown, New Delhi, uh, there is a very big, uh, uh, big enterprise called DLF, which is the biggest real estate player. Very politically connected real estate guy, but also, so he would be in, well, where is it? Government connected, right? but also intensely creative. And what is the creativity there? The creativity there is that this guy was the first fellow to spend 15 years to go and think of creative solutions to induce India's famously fragmented small landowners to cede his land to him at reasonable prices. Right? That's creative, to find a way to get around social barriers, ethnic barriers, caste barriers that prevent you to bring together small land holdings so that you then have a large enough plot of land on which to build a real estate city and this is now India's richest city. India's richest city is Gurgaon, which is a subsidiary of New Delhi. Right. And it's built entirely by the creativity of one guy. So I would absolutely say this guy is responsible for enormous, enormous wealth creation, right. uh, both for himself, but also the spillovers to society are massive. But he's also very government connected and very politically compromised. So that's a little bit of the, uh, so I, I love this taxonomy, but as all taxonomies do, it's an approximation and uh, uh, that's one place in, in the assumption that government connected and financed uh, necessarily uh, are antithetical to creativity. Uh, that, that's one thing that I would uh, uh, question. And your example of the Koreans, right? If you go back to the, to the Korean sources and see uh, why was the Lee family or why was this X family supported by the Korean government, uh, it was looking for people who had, uh, at least in the judgment of the military dictator at the time, it was in the judgment of that person that this group is worth backing because they're able to deliver the goods. So there was a merit argument for why these particular ones were supported. So just some comments on the taxonomy. Uh, I found myself thinking about what motivates people. Is it wealth? Is it extreme wealth? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, not, not sure. Uh, you should, uh, one thing you might look up, it's a lovely interview that I saw recently of the founder of uh, Novo Nordis, the uh, Danish uh, uh, insulin diabetes management firm uh, talking about uh, you know, how wealth plays into the European sensibilities. And it's sort of radically different from my students who are all headed for hedge funds or Silicon Valley. Um, I'll let you guess which way it is. Um, then Caroline, Caroline doesn't quite say this, but uh, sort of implies, and I might be putting words in her mouth, in which case I apologize, is moral outrage about inequality a luxury good, right? Um, you know, I chair the Government of India's Commission on Entrepreneurship. In other words, I'm uh, uh, responsible for designing entrepreneurship policy in India as we speak, uh, which is a crazy task in and of itself. Uh, but I find myself thinking about all this, and I have to agree with the sentiment, uh, sentiment expressed in Caroline's book, that uh, billionaires and, you know, outrage about billionaires is just not on, is just not on the radar screen. It's not important. It's just not there. It's, it's, poverty of 800 million people that, uh, that uh, uh, we're centrally concerned with. Um, uh, and you know, if somebody makes, uh, so my attitude very much, and again, I'm revealing my biases is, um, uh, if somebody, uh, you know, so there was a guy who famously made uh, 10 or 20 million bucks building a fabulous microfinance firm in India, 
right? And there's a lot of outrage about it, which is how can you take 20 million bucks uh, by lending uh, small amounts of money to poor women? And my attitude was, uh, okay, you made, uh, so these are millionaires, not billionaires, right? So my attitude was, fine, you made 10 million bucks. Uh, I'm okay with it if you also lifted seven or eight million women out of poverty, I'm fine. Uh, but if I ask my classroom, uh, do you think, is there something morally inappropriate about somebody making 20 million bucks uh, off the backs, allegedly, of uh, poor women, uh, a good third of them will say, and this is in the Harvard Business Room classroom, a good third of them will say this is morally not acceptable. Right? And I find myself thinking a lot about that. And, uh, uh, but I think it's an interesting, interesting question for you to pursue in your, in your own work. Um, the focus on individuals is fabulous. Um, uh, I think it's a fair statement to say that economists don't generally focus on individuals. Um, uh, but I think uh, Caroline takes us a nice step in that direction to begin to think about it. So let me stop with those comments. It's a lovely book, I recommend it, like Tyler does, uh, very thought-provoking, and uh, lots of room for doing more, more and interesting work. So. Thank you, Tarun. Thank you, Tyler. Those were superb discussions, and I think they not only reflect on the excellence of our two discussants, but as they said, on the richness of the data and the analysis in Carolyn's book. Um, we are not only uh, happy to have such distinguished and substantive people on our formal program, we have many similarly distinguished and substantive people in our audience present with us today. I'd like to open the floor to questions from the audience just to recap our usual rules. Uh, there is a moving microphone up front held by Jessica. There's a standing microphone at back. Please wait to be recognized. Feel free to line up at the back microphone. Identify yourself when you speak, and I hope this is not a necessary reminder, but pretend you're asking a question even if you wish to make a statement. Um, <laughs> who would like to uh, open our discussion? Anyone? Really? <laughs> okay, Antoine, could you give the, uh, the microphone there? Uh, I was very intrigued. I'm sorry, who are you? Uh, Ant Antoine von Achtmal. And I actually wrote about this subject some time ago. Um, I was very intrigued by what all three of you said about really the issue of globalization or the issue of of um, global trade. Uh, one of you mentioned that it used to be three times, now it's one time. And the impact going forward. So my question is, could you talk a little bit more about this? Because I think this is a really, really important topic when you look at the future of, of uh, what you wrote about. Thank you. Um, why don't we just go in the order in which we spoke before? So Carolyn, Tyler, and then Tarun. So when you're talking about globalization, I guess you mean beyond trade, FDI, um, sort of everything. Trade, trade. okay. Um, so as a trade economist, that's actually what brought me to this topic. And one thing I've seen in the work that uh, I've done on trade is that the, when, you, when you look at the distribution of exporters, exporters are, exports are really concentrated in the top few firms. So the top single firm in a typical developing country is 15% of exports. The top five firms, five firms, are a third of exports. So individual firms really matter. Um, and then you look at the countries who've grown and done well and industrialized, and trade has been a really big part of that. So it's very hard to think of any country that has phenomenally fast growth that didn't do it through exports. So you have the Korea, you, you have the other uh, uh, East Asian tigers, now we have China, and trade has just been so important. So it kind of, for me, started from trade to the individual firm, then all the way down in this book to the individual behind these superstar firms. 
Um, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm completely answering your question, but I actually want to quickly tie it to something Tyler said about the, the rise and fall <laughs> of the billionaires, which is um, we've had the globalization, we've had the slowdown in trade, so is this process kind of what, what's happening now? And I, I wish I could answer that question because I think there's so much uncertainty out there in the world. But uh, one thing I did do before coming here today was look at the top 100 billionaires to see you know, how they fare now versus 2014 uh, with so much volatility in emerging markets. Um, and w it, it kind of fits to this idea of moving towards China or moving towards the, the US and, and potentially India that, and, and as Warren Buffett said back in, in the financial crisis, uh, when the tide goes down, you see who's swimming naked, that it's the oil billionaires who are, of course, losing. So, so, so they're falling out. The, the top loser in the top 100 is, is Harold Hamm, the, uh, an American oil billionaire, but you also see the Russians uh, up there. And, but the winners, there's a group that's doing phenomenally well still and whose fortunes have increased, and they're the industrialists and the people doing real products that are trading around the world. And this is still the future. These people are going to survive, and we are going to see the group in, in, in China, India, et cetera. I, I do believe the future of globalization is going to support these types of traded goods industries. Terrific. Tyler, would you like to comment on the role of trade and globalization in this? I suspect the age of export-led growth creating a durable middle class is over because there's so much automation. So when the US manufacturing employment peaks around 1977, I think at about 28% of the labor force, these days countries such as India, Brazil, in terms of employment, they're deindustrializing at ranges between 10 to 15% of the labor force. And India's trying to export services, but there's not the same scalability there. So that's a big factor looking forward. Danny Roderick probably is correct. This will be a big issue. Great. Tarun? I'll just make one, uh, one, one, one comment. Um, if you look at um, the sources of uh, entrepreneurship underlying the billionaires, many of whom are in Caroline's book, uh, in countries like India and Indonesia, uh, but more so India. Very few of them are tried, uh, tied to the commodity boom, obviously. Uh, Indonesia, of course, there are some. Um, a lot of them are providing services to the local economy because there's enough scale in the local economy. Healthcare, real estate, uh, cell phone services, mobile payments, uh, online services. These are all you know, five or six sectors that have nothing to do with trade. Uh, and have all amassed fortunes of a few billion dollars in the space of uh, literally six or seven years. So I suspect that there is, it's country specific and uh, in the predictable way, which is if you have a large domestic market that's relatively resource poor um, and full of problems, as Tyler was saying in his comment earlier on, the bigger the problems, the bigger the opportunity. That's another way to see it, uh, that you will see sources of extreme wealth creation that are uncorrelated with uh, movements in trade. Thank you. Let me go to the back mic, please. Uh, Peter Sturm, I used to work for the OECD and the IMF. Uh, thank you very much to the authors and the commentators for a very interesting and stimulating discussion. I was struck by the lack of mentioning of Europe in this discussion. And I'm wondering whether that's a vice or virtue. I mean, is Europe beyond uh, the pale or do they something right that they don't merit? invention, more specifically when uh, the attention turned to the future prospects of wealth development, uh, one of the fundamental factors mentioned were uh, scale of the economy, infrastructure, and education. And I think in all three aspects, Europe seems to be pretty well positioned. How do you explain the lack of uh, attention to Europe in this particular discussion, and how would you judge Europeans' prospects and position in the aspect of wealth creation and uh, innovation? Uh, I think Carolyn can give you a very concise and powerful answer, but I would just remind you, Peter, that as our 43rd president told us, uh, the French have no word for entrepreneur. 
<laughs> Carolyn. So the book is focused on emerging markets, so, so I, I kept my presentation there. The working paper actually compares Europe and the US. And what you see in Europe is a high level of inherited wealth. So way back when, I guess they must have had a word for entrepreneurship, because they also did pretty good around the turn of the 19th century. But it's really, it's really fallen off. They also have, have much lower, on average, inheritance and estate taxes than the US. So I don't know if that feeds into it. But especially continental Europe, it's, it's a lot of inherited wealth. Like I said, a, a tight answer, but just to plug again, Carolyn mentioned, consistent with our policies, all the data, all the analysis that Sarah and she did are available on the website, the data sets there. I recommend to you who are interested that the working paper, because as Carolyn said, it does go into a lot more of these global regional things and is less focused solely on emerging markets. Uh, please also at the back mic. Nicholas Veron here at the Institute. Uh, Caroline, as you know, I'm a huge fan of this research. I think it's phenomenal. I guess one of the pushback you will receive is that there is a way in which you are looking under the lamppost, which is you cannot observe unobservable wealth, which is, you know, ill-gotten gains. Uh, and people think of, you know, Prince Links in China, the Putin family, Wen Jiabao family, all sorts of stories in the press. Uh, so by definition, what's not reported uh, cannot be analyzed quantitatively, but what would you respond to the people who will say, well, your statements are way too optimistic about Chinese entrepreneurs and the like because they leave aside all the wealth with even bigger fortunes uh, linked to political con connections, corruption, and uh, rent abuse? Thank you very much, Nicola. And maybe we can also, since Tarun raised the issue of the, the corruption research literature, he can also make a comment. But Carolyn. Um, that's a great question. I think one issue, one way of thinking about it is that the, the, what we can observe are the people that are part of the, the top of business in a country. And so unfortunately, we don't have the millionaires by name, though I like the idea of sort of comparing the ratio. But here we can see the top of big business, what activities are openly well rewarded in a country. Uh, and that gives us some idea of the texture of the business climate there. The, it, and in some ways, you can see that wealth is going somewhere else simply by the absence of this group. So the MENA region is a perfect example where you just don't see any company founders. So there are a few families that have existed for a really long time and keep passing down the, the, the wealth, but you don't see the rise of, of entrepreneurs, and they actually come out low on all the, you know, relative to sort of GDP per capita, where relative to trends, where you'd expect, because this isn't picking up wealth. It's picking up business-related wealth, and we get a sense of that, but we don't. We don't get a sense of all the wealth out there that's hidden. Great. Tarun? I, you know, I think that's an excellent comment. Um, uh, and ju ju just to be clear, I'm not saying that there's, I mean, there's untrammeled corruption in China and in India. Uh, and I think one of the interesting academic questions is uh, whether there's more in a sort of authoritarian type setting or a democratic setting, just comparing those two countries for a second. I think it's an open issue. There are some interesting uh, uh, theory models, you know, in, uh, in the economics literature that speculated about decentralized and centralized corruption and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's very few empirical tests. Um, yeah, my point was more not that corruption doesn't exist, it manifestly does. Uh, you see that in the aggregate indices, you see that if you're on the ground, as am I, very often. Uh, but it's just that there are also ample examples of constructive, uh, socially welfare-enhancing entrepreneurship uh, that I think we've relatively less focused on, and that's why the book, I think, is so, so welcome. Thank you. Uh, our colleague, Paolo Moro, another senior fellow at the Institute, um, was one of the leading scholars on corruption. He raised his hand. I don't know if he's coming in on this issue or a different issue, but please. I'm Paolo Mauro, I'm a senior fellow here. I'm actually also a, uh, the resident socialist in the group. Uh, <laughs> and the question is uh, on a slightly different topic. Uh, my question is, can you speculate a little bit uh, as to suppose that the top marginal income tax rate is 90%? 
Caroline, you've kind of gotten to know all of these entrepreneurs by reading about them, and Tarun, you've worked with some of these people. So is your sense that if we had much higher taxation of extreme wealth or extreme incomes, would people be as creative? Would they work as hard? How do you, how do you yes, speculate? I, so, so, and, so, and, and, and I also want, Tyler, of course, has written about these issues very much in a US context. So I'd be very interested in his views as well. But please, Tyler. So, uh, Paulo, we ran this experiment uh, in India. We had 90% tax rates. And there was intense creativity uh, as a result. But it was creativity about hiding money. <laughs> and creativity, I mean, and I mean it, intense creativity. Um, you know, my social circles participated in this, so I lived it. Um, uh, yeah, we ran that experiment. It didn't, uh, it sort of uh, immediately reduced, um, uh, so, you know, in economic seas, it immediately reduced the positive spillovers to society uh, without accomplishing any diminution in true net worth. Um, it was just hidden in different, different pots. That would be my, my prediction is exactly what would happen again. Tyler, what's your take on these issues? I think of stability as all important. And you have stability when your economic power bases and political power bases are not too far apart from each other. So you just can't have a 90% rate. You can't. Um, just a comment on that about wealth. I, I, I agree, especially because many of these people maintain control of the companies that they created. And that's precisely what, ma what, ma what, what allows the companies to continue to perform as well as they do for the time they do, the individuals matter. That said, I think you can have extremely high in estate taxes. So we did have a long period of 70 plus estate taxes in this country and things worked pretty well. And as a result of that long period, we have a lot less inherited wealth in this country than um, they have in, in Europe. It also tends to promote philanthropy. So that's a tradition that the US developed that is less apparent in, in other parts of the world, maybe, maybe also in the UK. Thank you very much for that. We have time for one more question. Well, let me take two together, because I want them both to get in. We have Rory and then Catherine. Rory. Um, my name is Rory McFarker. I'm now a visiting fellow here at Peterson. Welcome, Rory McFarquhar, from your distinguished public service at the White House. We are glad to have you with us. Thank you. Um, I was very struck by the optimistic presentation of emerging market billionaires and, um, and also your careful typology that showed how many of them are actually founders of companies rather than the, you know, the classic image of oligarchs. Um, the question in my mind is, how do we prevent even company founders from becoming oligarchs and pulling up the ladder and preventing further dynamism in their economies? Thank you. And finally, at, up here at the head table, the last word. I'm Katie Russ on leave from UC Davis. Um, so Kana and Palepu have a really nice article on the Indian software industry from some time ago. And they argue that strong antitrust law was important to preserve some incentives for entrepreneurship in this environment of concentrated wealth, wealth um, and uh, some market power. Is there a role for other types of policy uh, in ensuring that in this environment with increasing um, incidences of extreme wealth that you're showing that we still preserve incentive and um, ability to enter industries? Thanks, and uh, so let me just suggest Tyler, Tarun, and then Carolyn last. My understanding of China and India is that the billionaires are not the political problem. They're relatively cosmopolitan. Uh, in the case of India, it's the government and the Communist Party, uh, not Jack Ma's the problem. India may be a more populist story, but I'm not worried about the billionaires getting too much power and then pulling up the ladder. I think on net, they're a good influence on politics in most of these countries. Thank you, Torun. Yeah, so you know, connecting both the both the questions, um, um, I think there's a huge role for your basic garden variety good economic policy, which is support, uh, you know, the kinds of institutions that we need, whether it's antitrust uh, type of institutions which are woefully underdeveloped in these countries, 
for very good reasons um, having to do with the, with the histories. Um, uh, or provision of risk capital on the margin, making it easier to get that so that there's more net entry that isn't tied to uh, cash flows from incumbency. I mean, just those two things, if I could think of, would, would go a long way in preventing the ladder from being pulled out under the rug by policy interventions. Um, you know, so that's, that's, and I think that's common to both the, uh, both the comments that you made. Yeah. Carolyn? Yeah, I guess the question is, what happens when a kitten becomes a cat? And uh, uh, so competition policy is part of it, and that's exactly what, what happened in the U.S. Um, as, as our kittens became, became, became cats, and, and, and we developed antitrust policy, which then took some time mm -hmm. to actually be implemented, but, but still serves today. So I think as economies reach the stage where they need it, it will arise, just as we worried about China and the environment, and we still worry, but as they've grown richer, they're, they're learning to worry too. I think this is an issue they'll worry about. And then just to piggyback on something Tyler said, it's also a little bit different in emerging markets where in many countries, their views may be much more aligned with the population than closely related to the government and trying to get favors. So for a while, China kind of prevented anyone from getting too rich precisely because of the power they would have and then, and then could work against the government. And we've seen in both China and Russia billionaires landing in prison precisely because they sometimes um, uh, may push against the, the current regime. So, so there is a case where, um, where, where their views may, may not always be leaning towards, towards the government. And then finally, just a last, a last final plug on, on trade is for many, in many countries, especially the smaller ones, the only way to get rich is really, really rich is through trade. And trade also keeps you honest because if you're competitive around the world, you're, you're not really benefiting from, from monopoly power. And it, it also is the pressure within your own country to keep things competitive. Terrific. Thank you all very much for joining us today for what I hope you will agree, and I'm sure you will. It's been an incredibly rich discussion. Thank you to Tyler Cowan and Tarun Khanna for providing their unique insights of their own and raising the discussion to that level. And thank you especially to Carolyn Freund for her groundbreaking study, which the Peterson Institute is very proud to publish. The book is Rich People, Poor Countries. Go out there, tell everyone to read it. They should. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>